Okay, yeah, now I think we're, we're good. Okay, yes, so I'm going to present on work that we've been doing on unsupervised analysis of spatially resolved transcriptomic data with a package we've developed called NNSVG, and that's within the bioconductor framework. So I'll start with some background on spatially resolved transcriptomics. So this is referring to new uh, technological platforms that let us measure transcriptome-wide gene expression at spatial resolution on tissue slides. By that we mean, so we're measuring expression of thousands of genes at a set of thousands of spatial locations on, on small tissue slides. The illustration I've got here is from the 10X Genomics Visium platform, which is one of the most widely used platforms right now. So here there's a, a grid of spatial locations on the tissue slide in a, in a hexagonal arrangement in the, in the latest version. Um, and at each one of those lo locations that are called spots, we're measuring transfer time scale expression of thousands of genes uh, by, by sequencing. So they're tagged with spatial barcodes and then uh, sent for sequencing. And then examples of, of unsupervised analysis that we can do in this data is identifying spatial domains, spatially distributed cell populations, and spatially variable genes, which I'll talk about more. And I like this, um, this uh, illustration of uh, showing how, how this, this fits in with, with previous technologies. So in bulk RNA sequencing, uh, we've got uh, all different uh, types of cells all measured at once. And in single cell RNA sequencing, we can identify cell populations, but in spatially resolved transcriptomics, we can also identify the spatial coordinates where they, where they came from. And then this uh, illustration here from the, the human brain. And in terms of the data, this means we, we end up with uh, tables of expression counts, which we usually format as genes by cells or genes by spatial locations in the spatial world. Uh, and then in the case of spatial, spatially resolved transcriptomics, we have these additional columns of the spatial locations that each measurement came, for, came from. Uh, and also it's possible to, uh, to derive image features such as morphological features or number of, of cells per spot. Uh, in this work, we're using the, the expression counts and the spatial locations. Now, spatially variable genes. So here we're referring to uh, any genes that have spatially defined patterns of expression across the tissue slide. And here I've got an illustration of six genes in, in a, a sample of human brain, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which was measured with the 10X genomics fusing platform. And in this region of the, the brain, there's this laminar layer structure. So the top three genes there, so this is the, the same slide six times, so showing six genes, uh, expression counts at each, each spot on this, this slide. Uh, the top three there are associated with the laminar structure and the bottom three are associated with, with other patterns for blood and immune processes. And a crucial feature here, if we're trying to identify these genes, is that depending on the structure that they're associated with, they can vary across different distances, which is what I've annotated there with those red arrows. So some of the genes have quite large patterns, others have smaller patterns. And in unsupervised analyses, we want to identify the top genes in, in a data set that are associated with this, with any structures of interest in there. And doing that in a way that takes into account uh, this different varying range of expression is, is, is quite tricky. Now, why look for spatially variable genes in the first place? So there are two main tasks that we do with this. The first is from a perspective of data pre-processing and data reduction. So we're reducing the number of genes to a smaller set of biologically informative genes instead of the, the full set of, of 20,000 or so protein coding genes. Secondly, uh, and in that case, we can use that as a, as a feature selection pre-processing step for further downstream analysis. Secondly, also identifying a top list of top informative genes to investigate individually. So uh, really top genes associated with specific processes. And then the question becomes how to define biologically informative. So in the non-spatial world, we use methods called highly variable genes. Um, and then in the spatial, spatial world, taking into account the spatial coordinates as well. And that's, uh, that's referred to as the spatially variable genes. And in, in, an in an analysis workflow, this, uh, as I just mentioned, this fits into the, the feature selection 
which in, it can be viewed as a pre-processing step. So feature selection, reducing the dimensionality from 20,000 or so genes to often around 1,000, that reduces noise and improves, improves computational performance for any further downstream steps, such as dimensionality reduction or clustering. Or secondly, to identify those top-ranked genes for further investigation individually. And yeah, so I mentioned uh, methods called highly variable genes for identifying non-spatial informative genes. So those methods are uh, more standardized by now. This has been around for a bit longer. So there we're ranking genes by excess biological variation above a technical trend, which accounts for a mean variance relationship in single cell data. But that does not take into account any spatial information. So then in spatial statistics, there are measures, measures including uh, Moran's I statistic, which can rank genes by observed spatial autocorrelation. But that has not been adapted to the specific properties of spatially resolved transcriptomics data. So now new methods have been developed to specifically focus on spatially variable genes. And several uh, papers were published recently on this, including these three, Spatial DE and Spark, and Spark X. So one of the first there, uh, Spatial DE, this fits, um, so this uses Gaussian process regression to add uh, using a spatial covariance function and a kernel on, distance, on, on distances. Uh, then uh, using a likelihood ratio test to uh, identify significant spatially variable genes. This was a really nice method. However, this scales cubically in the number of spatial locations. And with the new uh, 10X Germ Expedient platform, where we have thousands of spatial locations, this becomes uh, quite slow. So our work was on trying to adapt this in a way that lets us scale much faster and apply this to the, the newer platforms. So we've developed this method called NNSVG. This uses a technique from spatial statistics called nearest neighbor Gaussian processes, which approximates uh, the likelihood at a small set of nearest neighbors instead of the full uh, thousands of spatial locations, which approximates the data very well and then allows us to scale computationally linearly in terms of the number of spatial locations, which is a huge uh, improvement in terms of speed if we've got a, a large data set with thousands of spatial locations. And uh, this NNGP framework uh, was implemented at the time in two packages, SP NNGP and BRISC. We've adapted the or we've applied the BRISC uh, package in the context of specially resolved transcriptomics data to apply this in a, in a linear manner to, to our data. The methodology works like this. So we, we fit a, a model, one model per gene using, using BRISC, extracting the max, maximum likelihood parameter estimates, uh, and then again using a likelihood ratio test to compare model with and without spatial terms, and then using those likelihood ratio statistics to rank genes in, by the strength of their spatial patterns across the tissue slide. And that lets us do uh, unsupervised analyses where we can simply rank all genes in the data set in terms of the strength of their spatial patterns. And crucially, this model has a uh, uh, flexible length scale parameter. So that was uh, this red arrow that I had annotated previously in the, in the example of spatially variable genes. So we can identify spatially variable genes with flexible length scale parameters for different uh, biological processes within the same data set. We can also include covariates for spatial domains, which lets us look for spatially variable genes within subregions. Uh, and then, yeah, we, rank genes by the likelihood ratio statistic. Uh, and the crucial point here is that this becomes linear in the number of spatial locations due to our use of the NNGP framework. We have a gene specific length scale parameter that's fitted independently per gene and we can include covariates for spatial domains. We've parallelized this, implemented the package uh, using um, using bioconductor, runtime is around 45 minutes on a laptop for one VCM slide. Now I've got some results where we've evaluated this on several specific data sets. Uh, so this is again that same data set I showed previously from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the human brain. 
uh, those six genes that we're particularly interested in here. And at the bottom left, actually, I've got some ground truth annotations from that same data set. So the bottom left is showing uh, six cortical layers and white matter. The white matter is the, the black region at the bottom left. And the second panel there is showing white matter versus all of the, the gray matter layers. And what we see when we fit our models, uh, one per gene here, is that we so here on the right, I'm showing the estimates of those length scale parameters that I mentioned before. And what we see there is that for the genes, the bottom three genes there, HPP, IgK, C, N, P, Y, we get very small estimated length scale parameters, which is what we want. So the model is correctly fitted to those small patterns in, in those three genes. And the ones at the top have much larger length scale parameters. So that's good. And then we evaluated this and compared it against um, several other methods. We evaluated it by um, calculating the rank of specific genes of interest within, within this data set and also doing the same for other data sets uh, later on. So on the left there, I'm showing these six specific genes of interest, showing the rank from NNSVG in dark blue and, and other methods in the other colors, showing the rank um, in the list of top spatially variable genes from each method uh, for each of those six genes. And we show that NNSVG in this data set and also in, in several other data sets recovers at high ranks uh, all of the main genes of interest that we, that we know about in these specific data sets. And um, other competing methods do not or not consistently across all of the data sets that we evaluate. Uh, here, uh, same thing again, we have a, a longer list of, so those were just six genes that I was talking about previously. We also have a list of 137 additional genes that were identified in that original study associated with those, those uh, cortical layers. And we show that we also get those um, as uh, significant spatially variable genes. And then we also, uh, simply plot the top uh, spatially variable genes from, from our method. So on the left here, we're showing our method. On the right, this was a competing method that we compare against. And here we show that the, those top 20 spatially variable genes, um, just the top 20 ranked ones, uh, most of them are associated with the white matter versus gray matter distinction, which we know is the strongest biological signal in this data set. So that's a, that's a good confirmation. Uh, we also do some simulations showing that it really is linear in the number of spatial locations. Here I'm subsampling the number of spatial locations per data set in two data sets and then running it uh, several times showing that that scales linearly, which is great. Um, right, and then I've got some details here about the implementation. So we've implemented this as an R package within the Bioconductor framework which uh, lets users integrate this into analysis workflows. Inputs um, and outputs are either spatial experiment objects, which I've got another slide coming up on, or simple numeric matrices, depending on what people prefer. It's parallelized using BIOC bio parallel, and the package is available from Bioconductor and GitHub. Uh, we've got some uh, vignettes and tutorials there showing, showing how to use it. Uh, the left one is the screenshot of the Bioconductor vignette. The right one is the GitHub README. And we've got a, a preprint uh, up on BioArchive uh, going through this in, in much more detail. And now here I've got some more details on, on analysis workflow. So I mentioned, so this is like one step in an unsupervised analysis workflow of, of especially resolved transcriptomics uh, data set. So we We've chosen to implement this within the Bioconductor framework. Uh, we, we really like Bioconductor. This is a, if, if you're not familiar with Bioconductor, it's an open source community-based uh, software development project for high, high throughput genomic analysis in R. Currently over 2000 contributed software packages there and uh, really nice standardized uh, data objects and, and uh, documentation standards. And specifically in this project, we've used the spatial experiment structure that we have also previously worked on. This is an extension of single cell experiment 
for spatially resolved transcriptomic data. So this is a, a data structure that stores uh, expression counts as well as row and column metadata. Uh, usually here rows will be genes and columns will be cells or spatial locations. So in spatial experiment, we've extended single cell experiment to include some additional um, slots, uh, additional structures specifically for the spatially resolved transcriptomic data, uh, such as the spatial coordinates and image information. This schematic uh, shows how the, the structure extends a single cell experiment. Um, and that's described in this paper as well, yeah, and available from Bioconductor. And we have a work in progress where we're uh, building up uh, an online book showing several example workflows of spatially resolved transcriptomics data uh, using the, this spatial experiment structure and going through a complete uh, analysis pipeline from pre-processing to feature selection, which I concentrated on in, in this talk, and also uh, continuing, continuing on with, with further downstream analyses. So this uh, will be uh, freely available online uh, through Bioconductor. Right now it's available uh, from my GitHub. Um, so yeah, going through a complete analysis pipeline for specially resolved transcriptomic data with, with example uh, data sets and um, interactive code. So in summary, I've talked about uh, our new method called NNSVG for identifying spatially variable genes in spatially resolved transcriptomics data. Uh, screenshot of the preprint there. So this um, lets us identify spatially, spatially variable genes in a linearly scalable manner in, in large uh, data sets. Uh, I also mentioned spatial experiment, our structure for storing spatially resolved trans transcriptomics data within Bioconductor and uh, OSTA, or orchestrating spatially resolved transcriptomics analysis with Bioconductor, uh, work in progress on analysis workflows. And that's the end of my talk. So thank you to all of my collaborators and my advisors and uh, funding. And that's it. Thank you.